So our, our primary purpose today is really to get deep into buffer calculations and looking at kind of all things buffers from a more quantitative kind of standpoint. Because I think conceptually, we can understand a buffer in terms of this is what it is, this is how it works. But it can be a little bit more difficult to actually get into the numbers behind what actually happens and why we see this pH change occurring. So just to kind of review, when strong acids or strong bases are added to a buffer system, we can safely assume that the conversion process that takes place is going to go to completion, that there will be a 100% conversion from the conjugate acid to the conjugate base or vice versa when these reactions happen. There isn't gonna be an equilibrium because the strength of that acid or the strength of that base is going to so flood the solution that it is forced to react. And so, the two things that can happen are these. When a strong acid is added to a buffer, that strong acid is going to give us lots of H plus. That H plus is going to react with the conjugate base, the A minus, and is going to make HA, the conjugate acid, as a result. That is what is going to happen to the buffer system when this occurs. And similarly, when we have a strong base added to our equilibrium system, it is going to be a complete consumption as well. But the strong base is going to react with the conjugate acid, HA, instead of the conjugate base steal its hydrogen, that'll make water, and we'll be left with the conjugate base A minus after the process. And so if you remember what we talked about yesterday, when these kinds of reactions occur inside of a buffer, all that we're really going to see is a change in the ratio of conjugate acid to conjugate base. And so long as we have both still present, it'll still be a buffer system. Only when we completely exhaust one of those concentrations, then we will have broken the buffer, then the strong acid characteristics or the strong base characteristics take over. So what it's asking us to do, we're gonna go back in time just a little bit here. We made a buffer with 0.45 moles of sodium acetate and 0.25 moles of acetic acid. pH of that buffer was five. We're gonna take that same buffer and do some stuff to it. So we had 0.45 moles of acetate ion, 0.25 moles of acetic acid in one liter. That was our buffer then. pH of that buffer we determined in a previous problem was five. 
what we're being asked to do is what is going to be the pH of the solution if we add 0.1 moles of HCl to the solution. And so again, this is where if we approach these buffer problems from the perspective of moles, as opposed to molarity, we will generally find that this is going to work better in our favor because there's going to be less calculation work going in. So what we're going to need to set up is what I call a mini ice table. And the reason I call it a mini ice table is because we're not going to take it all the way through all of this nonsense and into a KA expression. What we're going to do instead is we're just looking at a one-way reaction. Since we are adding HCl, that means that we are adding H plus. We are looking at what is the conversion between the acetate ion and the acetic acid that is going to happen as a result of this stress. And so from the perspective of an ice table, yes, this is technically an ice table, but there's no solving for X here. What we're looking at instead is we know we had 0.45 moles of acetate at the start. We have 0 0.10 moles of hydrogen ion that are being added to it. We have 0.25 moles of acetic acid at the start. So we've got starting materials here for everything. But remember, this is a one-way reaction. This is not reversible. So since it's a one-way reaction, we can go all the way back to chapter seven of Chem 105. This is a limiting reactant problem. And in any limiting reactant problem, the reaction is over when one of the reactants goes away. Since it's a one-to-one -one ratio, it's pretty easy to know which one's going to go away. It's going to be the hydrogen ion. So I'm going to lose this 0.1 moles. Since this is a reactant and it's one-to-one, -one, it'll also cause 0.1 moles of the acetate to go away. And that will get converted to 0 0.10 moles of acetic acid. The net results here, 0.35 moles of acetate, the hydrogen ion is gone, and 0.35 moles of acetic acid. All that has happened is that we have changed our ratio. Now, if we go back to example four here again, you can see we've already done a lot of this calculation. We're using the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation again the only difference is gonna be in this log ratio. We've already determined the pKa as 4.74. It's the same buffer system. So the pKa will still be 4.74. The only difference will be our, our ratio there. So we come back. pH is equal to pKa plus the log 
of the concentration of the base over acid. pKa is 4.74. We established that in the previous problem. Now we're putting the new ratios in, 0.35 moles divided by 0.35 moles. Point three five divided by point three five is one. The logarithm of one is zero. So our pH is equal to the pKa in this instance, which would be four point seven four. So we added a tenth of a mole of hydrochloric acid and the pH only went down by 0.26 units. Now, if we did the same thing to water, remember water would have a pH of seven if it were pure, but with this same amount of H plus in it, pH is equal to the negative log of H plus, which would be 0.1. Log of 0.1 is one, or negative one rather. So negative, negative one is 1.00. So by contrast, water under the same circumstances would have gone from pH seven to pH one. Our buffer went from pH five to pH 4.74. That's why buffers are good at what they do. That's how they keep the pH regulated to a particular value. And that's why we use pH buffers in a lot of circumstances where we want to regulate a particular concentration of hydrogen ion so that in the event that it gets contaminated with something, it can still maintain a relatively consistent pH. All right, any questions about this particular example? All right, let's take a look at another sample. Here I've got a buffer made by adding 0.25 moles of nitrous acid and 0.55 moles of sodium nitrite in enough water to make a liter of solution. First question, what is the pH of the buffer? Second question, what is the pH if I add five milliliters of two molar sodium hydroxide to the buffer? So for the first question, it's relatively straightforward. We just need to use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. pH is equal to pKa plus the log of the base over the acid. For pKa, we want the negative log of 5.6 times 10 to the negative fourth. And then for the log ratio, again, we can just use moles here. The nitrite would be our base. The nitrous acid would be our acid. So 0 0.550 over 0 0.250 would be appropriate. pKa for nitrous acid, 5.6 times 10 to the negative fourth. 
Negative log of that would be 3.25. divided by 0 0.25 is 2.20. And the logarithm of that, uh, three sig figs gives us three decimal places. So 0. 0.342. Now, when we add these two together, we gotta be mindful of our significant figure rules for adding. We're looking at the number of decimal places and making sure that we minimize that number of decimal places. Whichever one has the fewer decimal places, that's the one we round to. So when I put 3.25 and 0 0.342 in the calculator, my calculator gives me this, 3.592. Since I only knew this, number to two decimal places as opposed to this one to three. I need to round to the fewer digits. So we're gonna round to two dis digits, which would be 3.59. So 3.59 is the pH of this particular buffer. Now, what do we do about point number two here, where we have to do some kind of conversion? Well, just like we did in example six, the previous problem, we're gonna set up a mini ice table. The mini ice table in this case is going to be, since we're dealing with hydroxide ion, we're going to look at the hydroxide ion reacting with the nitrous acid to make water and the nitrate, or excuse me, the nitrite ion. And our setups are going to be the same way. Now, there is one little trick I'm going to introduce you to here, and that is something called millimoles. So millimoles, just like milliliters or milligrams or anything else, would be one one thousandth of a mole. And where it is useful is when we have volumes given to us in milliliters so that we don't have to convert them to liters first before we multiply. So I take the five milliliters of sodium hydroxide multiplied by its two molar concentration. I get 10 millimoles of hydroxide. Now, to convert our moles into millimoles, I would just need to multiply them by a thousand. So 250 millimoles of nitric acid. Water, we don't care about because it's not going to be in the henderson hasselbach equation. And we had 550 millimoles of nitrite at the start. Limiting reactant is the hydroxide. So we're gonna take away 10 from each of the reactants, add 10 to the products. In the end, we'll have no hydroxide, 240 
millimoles of nitrous acid, 560 millimoles of nitrite ion. And that's all that we need to do. We've, we've done the conversion. Now we just need to plug in the new values into that same Henderson-Hasselbalch equation to figure out the impact of that hydroxide. So pH is equal to the pKa, which we established was 3.25, plus the log. This time it'll be 560 over 240. Five sixty divided by two forty gives us a value here of two point three three. Log of that is 0.368. Calculator gives me 3.618, which again, I'm gonna to have to round to two decimal places because of the pKa. So it'd be 3.62. So in this case, we have barely registered a change in pH. And the main reason we haven't registered much of any change is because, well, we didn't add that much hydroxide compared to what was there. And so, so long as we stay within the confines of that buffer, what we're going to see is that not a whole lot's going to change unless we start to see drastic changes in the ratio. You know, the ratio went from 2.2 to 2.33 this time. In the previous example, it went from, uh, I can't remember, but it went from slightly less than one or slightly more than one to slightly less to one itself. We didn't see a big change in that one either. Any questions about this example? Okay, here is a third type of question. So we've already seen the first kind of question where we you know, just take the buffer solution and we manipulate it with either acid or base. Here's a new kind of situation. Let's say we have a carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system. And we want to keep that blood at a pH of 7.4. What is the ratio of acid to base to actually put it there? So this is kind of similar to one of the problems we did at the end of yesterday, where we've got what we want. Now we just need to kind of put it together. So again, pH is equal to pKa plus the log of base over acid. So the pH we're looking for in this case is 7.40. The pKa would be the opposite of the log of 4.4 times 10 to the negative seventh. And we're eventually gonna be looking for this 
ratio. Four point four times ten to the negative seventh. Its logarithm is negative six point three six. So the opposite of that would be positive six point three six. So keeping on with our algebra, we'll subtract each side by 6.36. And we get 1.04 is equal to the log of the base over the acid. To get rid of the logarithm, we're going to need to take the anti-log. 10 to the 1.04 the 1 power. would give us the three significant figures, 11.1. So the ratio of base to acid would be 11 to 11.1 11 to one. So I would need 11.1 .1 parts base for every one part acid. Unfortunately, that's not what it's actually asking us. It's asking us for the ratio of acid to base. So we're going to need to flip this. And when we do, point zero nine zero five. would be the result. So for every one part base, we would need 0 0.0905 parts acid. And so if we were actually going to make this buffer, that's how we would construct it. We would get some amount of carbonic acid and add enough base to it to get that molar ratio to be 11.1 .1 parts base to one part acid. And so one extension of this kind of problem would be to do just that. Let's say that we were told that we had 0.25 moles of base. Well, then we could easily do the algebra and figure out how much acid we needed. So just as an example, write it in here. Algebraically, we could solve that relatively easily and get 0 0.023. And so from this perspective, it, 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 it would make sense that if the pKa was that low and we're trying to get that much above it, the, the, the ratio is gonna be quite large. Like we said yesterday, buffering capacity is about plus or minus one to the pKa. So 
what we see in your blood is that the, the, the basic system is this bicarbonate system, but there are other pH adapters in there that will get it down to that 7.4 range from carbonate ion from other things as well. So it's a much more complex buffer than just carbonate and bicarbonate because you would look at this and say, wouldn't this make our blood really prone to base attack? There's only that much acid in the buffer. If I get rid of that acid, buffer's broken, I can get into alkalosis real quick. Well, there are other things in your blood to monitor that pH and bring it down to that natural level other than bicarbonate. So no, we are not super prone to base attack. There are other things that are actually helping along that system. The primary buffer is this carbonic acid buffer because again, carbonic acid has a direct link to the air that we breathe. Carbon dioxide coming in reacts with the water in our body systems and makes that carbonic acid. So that's what drives the acidic side of that, that ledger. But there are other factors that go into it as well. Any questions with this example? All right, so let's go through a couple of these um, and give you some time to try to work on these on your own here. We'll do one or two of them, take a break, and then we'll finish up and do some uh, do some more, introduce uh, titrations um, to close out today. Let's start with this one. Calculate the pH of a buffer made by combining 85 milliliters of 0.13 molar lactic acid with 95 milliliters of 0.15 molar sodium lactate. Ka for lactic acid is 1.38 times 10 to the negative fourth. Now, before you get too deep on this one, this is another place where it is advantageous to us to use that millimole method as opposed to the concentration method. Because what you have to consider here is that these two solutions are going to dilute each other. So if I want to new, do the concentration of lactic acid, I'm going to have to do a dilution equation to turn this concentration of lactic acid into the proper concentration. And I'd have to do the same thing with the sodium lactate as well. But if I just multiply the molarities times the volume, I will get millimoles of lactic acid and millimoles of sodium lactate. And Remember, for the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, I can use moles because in the end, they're swimming around in the same 180 milliliters of solution. So something to just kind of keep in mind as you start to work through this problem. I'll go ahead and leave you to it now. So... A little bit of pre-work here uh, done in advance. What you need to do is, again, we can't use the concentrations of the lactic acid and the lactate here. And the reason we can't is because I'm taking two solutions and combining them. They're going to dilute each other. So the original concentration on the bottle will not be the final concentration once we do the dilution. So if we were asked for the concentrations, that's what we would have to do. We'd have to do the dilution equation 
um, 85 times 0.13 divided by 180 to get the concentration of the lactic acid and, and, and similar for the lactate. But again, since the henderson hasselbach equation really only cares about the number of moles, I can shortcut that by just taking the molarity times the volume in milliliters, and that would give me millimoles. And if I do the millimoles and I round it correctly, I should get 11 millimoles of the acid, 14 millimoles of the lactate, the base. Now it's just a matter of putting it into the henderson hasselbach equation. Negative log of the Ka, 1.38 times 10 to the negative fourth. Plus the log of the base concentration, which would be 14 over the acid concentration, 11. The pH, the pKa is equal to one negative log of 1.38 times 10 to the negative fourth, which would be 3.860. Uh, since we have three sig figs, we'll have three decimal places. The log of 14 divided by 11 to two decimal places would be 0 0.10. So 3.96 would be our pH value. So relatively straightforward, just had to do that one little thing with the millimoles to avoid ourselves doing some longer calculations with the concentrations. Any questions with this example? All right, let's take a look at another example then. Okay, so we're using that same buffer from the previous question. Answer these two questions. If we added 10 milliliters of one molar sodium hydroxide, what would the pH be after that? If we added three milliliters of hydrobromic acid, what would the pH be after that? So start with the, the first buffer in those initial conditions in both sets. So just as a reminder, the pKa, was, what did we say, 3.86. And we had 14 millimoles of lactate and 11 millimoles of lactic acid. So those were our starting values. Those were the values that we established in the previous now we need to just go about solving it so again i'll give you a few minutes and then we'll come back and look at it together all right so let's let's look at these two questions here so for the first one, we were going to have to set up a, a modified ice table, a mini ice table like this, 
And again, limiting reactant still rules. So the hydroxide is going to run out first. So I'm going to lose 10 of it. That means it's going to go away. I'm going to lose 10 of the lactic acid. So it goes down to one. And I am going to gain 10 of lactate. So it goes up to 24. And so using the Henderson Hasselbach equation with these new numbers, pKa is still 3.86 because it's still the same buffer system. We've just modified the ratio. And we now have a log ratio of 24 to one. The log of 24 is 1.38. So if I combine those two together, 5.24 is the resulting pH. So Yes, we saw it went from 3.96 in the previous example to 5.24. That's a pretty significant jump. Why is it such a significant jump? Well, we're nearing the breaking point of the buffer. And so, so long as we stay in that confine of having significant portions of both, we're not going to see a whole lot of change. When we start to get toward the edges near where we will break the buffer, that's where we're going to start to see larger changes. Now, still, if we took the concentration, if we did this same very thing to water, we would have seen a significant spike in the pH. So this is still much more tempered change than what we would see for water on its own. For the second problem, we need to look at hydrogen ion from the hydrobromic acid reacting with the lactate ion to make lactic acid. So our mini ice table here is going to show nine millimoles of hydrogen ion, three times three. We still have the 14 millimoles of lactate and the 11 millimoles of the lactic acid. Limiting reactant rules still apply. I'm gonna lose the nine millimoles of the hydrogen ion. That's gonna bring it down to zero. In the process, I'll lose nine millimoles of lactate and I'll take it down to five and I will gain those same nine millimoles of lactic acid, bringing it up to 20. Henderson Hasselbach equation comes in again. 3.86 is still the pKa, but our log ratio has changed. It's now five over 20. Five over 20 is a quarter. The log of a quarter is negative 0 0.60, which means that our new pH is 3.26. So again, we went from 3.96 to 
not nearly as drastic of a change, but we're also not nearly as close to the breaking point of the buffer. And that's gonna, that makes a significant difference. So still, 0.7 change is noticeable. You'd be able to detect that um, with any reasonable pH probe, but not the same degree. You know, again, if we're adding nine millimoles of an acid to water, it's going to drastically change the pH of that water. Not so, not so as much here. Any questions with this example? All right, so one more example to do, and this is more on the side of the last one we did together. You're asked to prepare a buffer with a pH of five using 50 milliliters of one molar cinnamic acid, pKa is 4.440. How many grams of sodium cinnamate will you need to add to the solution? For purposes of simplicity, let's assume that the concentration is not going to change because we're not going to increase the volume. So take a few minutes and work this one through and uh, we'll come back and look at it on the other side. All right, walking around, it looks like most of you had the right tracker getting close. So let's, let's see what we have here. So, we needed to set up the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, keeping in mind that we are going to solve for this base to acid ratio. So the way I would construct it, the way I would do it, you could, and I saw some of you did this, you could have determined that there were 50 millimoles of cinnamic acid and put that in for A and kind of solve this as one big long algebra problem. The problem I see with that approach more often than not is that we get lost somewhere along the way. We make an algebraic mistake and we do something with that 50 millimoles that we're not supposed to and, and, and get lost. So the way I handled it was I put in the pKa and the pH values, solved for the ratio got a ratio of 3.6. So again, what does that mean? 3.6 parts base to every one part acid. So since we were able to determine that there were 50 millimoles, 50 milliliters times the one molar solution, if there are 3.6 parts base to every one part acid, that means that there were 180 millimoles of base which if we convert that now to moles would be 0.18 moles. And so how do you turn moles into grams? Well, this is a concept that you have seen since pretty much the beginning of Chem 105, you multiply by the molar mass. So multiplying that 0.18 moles by the molar mass, molar mass was 170.15, you would get 31 grams of sodium cinnamate. Now, from a sig fig standpoint, you might have gotten an extra digit in there. Um, and I wouldn't, have been, I wouldn't be too, too picky about that. The main reason I rounded it to two was because when we did our subtraction here, that only left us with two decimal places, which would in turn have given us two sig figs. And so that's kind of where I based everything out of as far as the rounding was concerned there. Now, the one assumption that we made about the volume change not occurring is probably foolish given the amount of solid that we're gonna have to add. Adding 31 grams to 50 milliliters of solution, 
there's a good chance the volume's going to change. Um, and therefore the, the ratio would not change though. And so that's the important thing to remember. And that's one of the reasons why we stray away from concentration in this application and look more toward the moles. Because from a molar perspective, from a moles perspective, it really doesn't matter if the volume of this substance changed to 75 milliliters as a result of adding all of this solid. That's immaterial because the mole ratio would be what we were expecting. You'd have 50 millimoles of acid and 180 millimoles of base. And that should give us the pH of five that we seek. All right, any questions about this um, final calculation example for today? So to close out today's lesson, I just wanna give us a little bit of a peek ahead to tomorrow, where tomorrow we are going to be looking at titrations and specifically looking at not titrations from the standpoint of can I find the concentration? We covered that in Chem 105, but more along the lines of can we create graphs that will help us to get other information about acids and bases other than their concentration. And so what we'll be focusing a lot more on in this study is going to be on the idea of looking at the equivalence point. So most of the stuff we did in Chem 105 focused on the end point where we were able to notice a color change in our indicator as opposed to the equivalence point, which is truly where the moles of acid and the moles of base have come to an equal point and all of the acid has been converted. All the acid has been neutralized and converted to its conjugate base. And so at that point, even in a weak acid equilibrium, we have no HA everything has been converted to A minus. And that focus is gonna be really important to us because that is what is going to allow us to do some of these other quantitative techniques that we were not able to do before. And so in Chem 105, we estimated that point using an indicator. And while the indicator does a good job of estimating it, it doesn't really give us true insight as to where that actually happens. A pH titration curve, a graphical representation of the titration and how the pH changes as we add more of that base is more appropriate for that kind of study. And this is what pH titration curves can look like. This is actually two different pH curves. One of them, the one in blue, for acetic acid. One of them here in red for hydrochloric acid. And so we can see that there are a lot of differences in the appearance and the shape of this curve that have to do with the acid itself and the nature and characteristics of the acid. Because both of them, because they are equal molar and we had equal volumes of them, they both have the same equivalence point here around 20 milliliters. But the pH at that equivalence point is different for each of them. And what happened before they got to the equivalence point is different for each of them. 
And so a lot of what we're going to be doing tomorrow is kind of studying those differences and learning how to, what to look for, how to look for it, and how to interpret that as we go. And so that's actually where I'm going to stop for today because to go further and looking at kind of the differences between the curves, I think we're going to get lost in the lost in the weeds a little bit with that one. So we're going to stop right there. We'll pick up with that kind of discussion tomorrow. And so all I need from you right now is just a little bit of feedback about the lecture today. And so go ahead and put that in. And then after that, we'll take our 10 minute break and we'll start lab at 10 o'clock as prescribed.